But we also want to make sure that Foster is as accessible as possible with that financial backing. We'll, we'll go ahead and like insert the disclaimer here at the bottom uh, about financial. <laughs> yeah, you get the get the little text on the bottom. <laughs> Number three, the GMAT. Scary. <laughs> All right, uh, excited to be here today um, at Grad Talk MBA by Magoosh. And we are here with two fabulous folks um, from University of Washington Foster MBA. Um, my name is Eric Allen. For those of you who don't know me, thanks for joining our podcast today. Um, Magoosh is an education technology company that aims to level the admissions playing field. Um, and um, we provide high quality, affordable test prep and admissions support. So really appreciate you joining us. And the purpose of today's podcast is to demystify the MBA application process, right? For those of you who are interested um, in graduate management education, um, so excited here to have um, two fabulous members of the Foster Admissions team. So we'll start with general introductions. Why don't you both introduce yourselves, um, your title, your schools, uh, give us a fun fact about yourself and also tell us maybe like how you got into the industry or what you love most about being in your role. Yeah, I'll go. Hi, I'm Noel Valdovinos, Associate Director for Diversity Recruitment at the Foster School of Business. Um, fun fact is that I am an identical twin brother. So I have someone else that looks like me out there in the world. And how did I end up in this field or line of work? Uh, I identify as a member of the LGBTQIA plus community, as well as a first generation Mexican American to uh, graduate from a four year. And a way that I give back to the community is through being service oriented. And I find that I am able to do that successfully through higher education and now specifically within MBA admissions and recruitment. That's been an area of passion for me for a long time creating access and opportunities. And I feel that that's how I ended up in this line of work. Thanks, Noe. Um, hey everyone, my name is Brent Nagamine. I'm our director of admission here at the Foster School for our full-time evening and global MBA programs. I have been on the Foster admissions team since 2019, but stepped into the director role back, uh, actually just last October, so coming up on a year. And my fun fact is that despite that title change, probably my biggest change of relationship with the school came about two and a half years ago, which is when I really bought into this program and I actually applied to and joined our evening MBA. And I had just wrapped up my second year of that three-year program um, as a student. So I've got a couple different hats here at Foster to answer the question that hopefully none of you are asking. No, I could not admit myself. I did have to actually apply, but I'm really loving it. Happy to be here. And as far as how I got into the industry, I, I've really kind of been a lifer on the admissions side. I started out in undergrad admissions um, here at the University of Washington, worked at another small liberal arts college on the East Coast, got my uh, first master's degree out there, and then pivoted back here and wanted to move up into the MBA space. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, I did not know that about either one of you, so um, that's new to me. Um, I guess the first question that I wanted to transition into was really talking about school specific uh, specifics. Um, you know, a lot of the candidates that come to us, they have a list of schools <clears throat> and then they get into the admissions process and it's really difficult for them to differentiate, you know, between schools. So how do you all think about um, how Foster differentiates itself from other programs? Yeah, great question. And, and I'll take that one first. <laughs> The reality is I want to acknowledge, I think probably most top MBA programs have more similarities than they have differences. And so as a candidate, if that's what you're struggling with, trying to differentiate the programs, you're not alone because I do think we probably have a lot of overlap. But if I'm talking to a student and I've only got a couple minutes, what I always want them to walk away with is an understanding of maybe three of our most important pillars for what makes Foster Foster. Um, the, the first one is going to be our location and the connection that we have to the Seattle community. I, I am actually incredibly impressed on a daily basis with how well connected the University of Washington and the Foster School is to the city of Seattle. And I would argue that there's probably not another MBA program in a major city 
that is as well connected to that city as Foster is to Seattle. And that gives our students a huge amount of opportunity and a huge amount of advantage when it comes to recruiting and networking, internship, consulting projects. It, it really does transform the student experience. And it also means that we can give our students incredible access to the professionals who are in the roles that maybe someday they're going to want to have. You know, I think in a typical year, we estimate that it's over 2,000 business professionals that walk through our doors here at Foster to interact with our students in one way or another. So access to the city of Seattle is huge. I would also say maybe a big part of that, um, the city of Seattle specifically, is the connection that we have to the tech industry. Um, you know, Foster is not a one-dimensional school by any means. We do a lot of things very well, but probably the one thing that is pretty undisputed about what we do better than almost every other program is going to be placement within tech. And um, again, we, we have a lot of students who go into other fields also, but tech is definitely the right now the the um, the driver for what what a lot of our students are interested in. So that all wrapped into Seattle is bullet point number one. Number two is going to be the ROI proposition. And it's, I think, pretty incredible, the, the products that we deliver to our students for relatively low tuition nationally. Um, you know, we've got the highest or at least among the highest job placement rates for uh, of all the top MBA programs in the country. Um, and we do that with one of the lowest base prices of tuition. Um, so again, it's, the, it's this measure between the imp low inputs and really high, impressive job placement outputs. Um, and then again, of course, it's not just that we're placing folks in any old job. I mean, we, our graduates are getting really impressive career opportunities. I think last year, our average starting salary for our graduates was about 147. And it was about 80% of our students who received a signing bonus, which brought the average first year compensation up to almost 190. So again, the, the quality of the output, the quality of the opportunities that our students get for the, um, for the amount of input and tuition dollars, it's pretty incredible. So that ROI proposition is number two. And then number three is, is gonna sound cliche, but it, it really is a community. And I think this is the most important one. Um, you know, I, I recognize every single MBA program has its values that it's built on. Um, and I don't think that's particularly unique. I, I think every school is probably very values driven in one way or another. It just so happens though that the values that foster is really based on, it, it's all about this community and collaboration mindset. Um, you know, I, I, I would argue that there is no school anywhere that lives the value of collaboration better than foster does. And we bake that into our, into our program here so that you cannot escape foster without learning how to work with others, um, learning from others and because of, of others instead of in spite of others. Um, so again, the, the collaborative mindset, I think, is the single unifying value, which maybe is going to be a different unifying value than what you might find at some other programs. Thank you for that. I mean, um, I know you're really close with the city of Seattle. So if you ever get season tickets, to um, maybe Mariners or um, you know any other sport teams like Seahawks, definitely send them my way. Um, you know where to find me. So that's fabulous. Yeah. And you know when you think about ROI, obviously people are talking about it now, where Supreme Court is is not going to allow this this kind of payback of loans. So it's on people's minds. So thank you very much for bringing that up, Brad. Yeah. Um, that was such a comprehensive answer. But is there anything? that maybe applicants couldn't find beyond what you just said, um, like on the website about Foster that maybe makes them unique? Anything else worth maybe mentioning to candidates? You know, that's that's a great question. And a lot of candidates ask me that directly. I, I wanna give credit to our website team. I think we do a good job of putting all the information out there. And so I, I would preface this by saying that as a candidate, if you're really digging, you'll probably find it somewhere on the website, but there's a difference between seeing the information on a screen and actually feeling it. And so, Eric, this might be a bit of a cop out to your question, but I think the one thing you can't really get on the website is being here and experiencing it for yourself. Um, you know, we've got a number of opportunities for folks to actually visit campus, whether it's something like our fostering MBA access event or our women's brunch or even just a shadow day. Um, you know, I, I think actually being here and getting on campus and sitting in a class, meeting the students, that's going to deliver a feeling and an experience that you can't get online. And I can attest to that. I have been there and that wonderful building there in the background is absolutely fabulous. Um, there's an incredible story behind it of sustainability. And I think it speaks to really what Foster's all about. So I can I can certainly plus one on that. 
Um, so let's let's uh, transition a little bit. So I, I've been working with Noe now for I think two years, or maybe you, maybe your brother. I don't really know anymore because I didn't <laughs> know you were a twin. So I don't know who I've been working with, but. Um, a lot of the clients that we have at Magoosh and Access come from under-resourced backgrounds, underserved backgrounds. How does Foster really focus on leveling the playing field for applicants from underrepresented or economically disadvantaged backgrounds? Yeah, thanks for asking that question, Eric. So at the Foster School, we do value diversity and we show this by numerous ways. The one that I like to always make a point in referencing is our partnership with diversity organizations. Uh, Magoosh being one of them uh, within AXIS and uh, Consortium, MLT, Forte, Ramba are other partnerships that we do have that allow us to be able to be transparent, accessible um, and visible to candidates that may not identify with the, the predominant uh, group of students that might be applying to an MBA competitive program. In addition to that, uh, our commitment with partnerships has dates back to 2016. But even before then, we've had uh, numerous uh, diversity initiatives that really allow uh, students from diverse backgrounds to feel, feel uh, valued, seen, and welcomed at the Foster School. And we continue to do that through numerous ways. Um, another way is through our student organizations. For example, we have Out in Business for students who identify as LGBTQIA+, as well as Diversity in Business, which is broken down into three affinity groups, uh, currently Latino, Black, and uh, Asian American. And through diversity in business, we are able to support our prospective applicants and our current students as well to kind of get a sense of how they belong and, and what they can do at the Foster School to bring in their own diversity and unique lived experiences. In addition to that, at the University of Washington, stepping out of the Foster School a little bit, we do have the Office of Minority Affairs and Diversity as well as the Graduate Student Equity and uh, Excellence Center, which also focuses on supporting first generation and students from diverse backgrounds in graduate level education. Uh, those are some of the resources. And within the Office of Admissions, we also hire student uh, workers who are in the MBA program, both in the full time and in the evening, to help us do that line of work and help us answer questions that, that students may have. For example, uh, I mentioned our diversity partnerships. We do have consortium liaisons, Forte ambassadors, LGBTQIA veterans, and diversity coordinators that really help us move that needle forward to where we want to be uh, diversely here at the Foster School. So that's just to name a few of the uh, initiatives that we have going on at the Foster School. And I would say continuously, we continue to do that. Two events that we do have upcoming that support that mission are also fostering MBA access, which will happen November 2nd and 3rd of this uh, upcoming academic year, as well as Women's Brunch on October 22nd. So that's just an alignment to how we serve and make uh, foster accessible to groups from marginalized communities who historically have not been represented in MBA programs. That's great. And for those of you who are listening to the podcast, that's 2023 dates. If you're listening to this in 2024 and beyond, we certainly hope that you are. Definitely check the website and see what events are coming up um, you know, with Foster as it, as it uh, relates to diversity and inclusion. So thank you for that. All right, let's put all yeah, that. Can, yeah. can I add one other thing to yeah. that? Because um, the support systems that exist are incredibly important. But I do also want to share one other way that we specifically want to make sure that we're accessible to all applicants. Um, and it's, it is through financial backing. Um, you know, there's, a, there's an element of putting our money where our mm -hmm. mouth is. And over the past couple of years, our scholarship budget has increased dramatically. Um, you know, I, my, my wife is a lawyer. She's warned me, I've got to be careful with what I say because I don't want to make any promises. Mm -hmm. But just for context, this past for the past two years, 100% um, of our incoming full-time MBA students have received at least some form of a scholarship. Um, and I, again, I can't promise that that's how it's going to happen in the future, but that's made possible because of our investment in supporting students financially. So we've got those systems in place to support folks to make sure we've got the the um, you know the the inclusion once folks are here. But we also want to make sure that Foster is as accessible as possible with that financial backing. All right, thanks, Brian. We'll, we'll go ahead and like insert the disclaimer here at the bottom. Yeah. Uh, about we'll get, the, get the little text on the bottom. <laughs> Absolutely, um, but that's great to know. Um, 
All right, so uh, we're going to put on the admissions hats now um, and your and your um, perspective on admissions. I think one of the questions that we get as it relates to kind of thinking about the admissions process, um, you know, the first question we often get is like, how long does it take? Like, how much time would you recommend setting aside for putting together the application um, part of uh, the application process? Yeah, uh, I can answer that. So I will say that that also really depends on the student and where they are in that journey. Um, I would recommend anywhere between eight to 12 months just to get a head start on what students need to prepare for when they are looking at a program to do the research to uh, apply to take a GMAT or GRE test if they are applying with the test. Or it also depends, you know, where they are in the journey. Have they thought about coming to an MBA program in the past and they have done their research? So they might need anywhere between um, three to five months to apply because they already have their recommenders and they feel strongly with the profile that they have coming in with the years of experience. I would say that really depends on where the student at is on their personal journey because it varies for for everyone and where they are at. But um, best bet, I would say anywhere between eight to nine to 12 months in advance, just to do that research with connecting with the school, attending events in person, online, and and really preparing yourself to be uh, academically competitive to the program that you are applying to. Uh, I know that's more of a broad answer because you know it, it varies by student to student. Uh, but it really depends where the student is academically, uh, professionally in their journey uh, to begin an MBA program. And you you both worked in the admissions space for some time. <clears throat> is there a particular area within uh, the the application process that you may feel applicants maybe don't take enough time to focus on or you see that, you know, every everything else is really strong, except this area tends to be on the weaker side. Like what is that pothole that you can kind of advise candidates about that they need to spend more time on um, through the process? Yeah, I can comment on this. Feel free to add anything that I might be missing. But one thing that I do like to emphasize for all of our applicants is to also spend time on the uh, optional essay questions because that also gives us more background and uh, a lens to view the student in a more holistic way that we wouldn't otherwise. So that's maybe one thing that not every applicant may take advantage of. And it really helps the admission counselors, us here at Foster, to really make uh, an assessment on a student's application holistically. That personal essay, optional essay, uh, does give us more insights and it really gives us a sense of who we are admitting because we are looking for that foster fit. Those personal essays or optional essays really give us that background of the student holistically in another way. Aside from the test scores, you know, the undergraduate GPA, the other required materials that they have to submit to us. Uh, that's one thing that I would encourage every applicant when applying to foster to really dive into that optional essay as well. Okay, that's great. Um, <clears throat> when you think about the optional essay as a quick follow-up question, I think what I hear a lot is, um, oh, that, that essay is only if I have a weakness that I need to kind of address. Um, do you encourage maybe someone who comes from a slightly different background or has had some challenges in their story that they didn't that didn't necessarily fit into kind of the typical questions on your application. Do you encourage them to share that? Um, because I do think sometimes there's some reluctance to share maybe a positive background or maybe um, and some challenges in a candidate's background that may be seen as kind of like they're like complaining or or um, they're looking to seek empathy from you all. So could you just maybe speak to that in terms of how you think about essays that aren't filling holes, but are really providing additional context? Yeah, I would say I encourage students to submit whatever they feel comfortable submitting. And if they feel that talking about a particular area of weakness that may not 
be as, as strong to mention. They could also reword that or frame it into a positive as well so that it doesn't seem like they are complaining, complaining about something. If it is, uh, you know, a situation that is outside of their control, uh, that's something that could also be explained in the personal essay. At Foster, I, I wouldn't say that, that we view any, uh, any disclosures as a weakness. It's really what the student feels comfortable in sharing with us that feels would make them a strong applicant at Foster because of it and not necessarily a complaint due to uh, an adversity or a challenge that they have faced. So it's really an opportunity to be vulnerable with the admissions committee as a way to let us know how you would fit into our community and what the re those reasons are. Okay, great. Um, when you think about the elements of the application from resume to interview to everything in it, would you say there's an element that maybe candidates overvalue? I know you talked about undervaluing kind of the, the optional essay. But is there something that another component that maybe they undervalue and, and maybe a component that they overvalue or maybe spend too much time on and you can kind of tell like, they were putting all of their eggs in that basket and they, they really failed to put their eggs in, in a more appropriate basket, if you will. I'm going to jump in. Go for it. Yeah. That, that's hard because we, we use the holistic review process, which means that everything a candidate submits does matter. But to this question, is there something that's overvalued? I, I do sometimes think that a lot of candidates place so much emphasis on some things like the test scores, which are important. I, I mean, please don't hear what I'm not saying. You know, the test scores, we look at them, they're among the first metrics that we consider. Um, but I do hear some candidates believing that the test score in and of itself will decide the admission, that if their score is above a certain threshold, they're getting in wherever they want, regardless of their values, regardless of their fit in the resume. And then I hear on the other side, some candidates very discouraged, thinking that if they're not above a certain threshold, they, their application is just going to be tossed right into the shredder. And, and I think that level of importance is really not how we assign it at all. You know, the test score, it's, it's one of many metrics that we look at. And again, it, it is important. We do use it, um, for, for candidates who submit it, but it is not the be all and end all. No, that's really helpful. Um, kind of a, I don't know, interesting, fun question. We've seen, you know, chat GPT and other AI tools out there. Um, and, you know, we were recently at GMAC conference this year um, and there was quite a bit said around AI. Have you seen candidates begin to use AI and, and maybe more broadly, what do you think the impact of AI will be um, on your application process um, or general um, admissions? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to jump in on this right one, too. You know, I, Eric, you mentioned we were at the GMAT conference recently, and I sat in on a number of those conversations. And I know I heard colleagues across the industry who I think are very understandably concerned about the impacts of generative AI and how that may um, take away from the credibility of, of candidates' work. Um, and I, I heard people in response to that trying to figure out how can we limit the use of AI. And, and the reality is, I, you know, that, that box is open. I don't think we're closing it. You know, you can't squeeze that toothpaste back into the tube. Um, and so what I would expect is that AI is going to become an, and I should note here, we Foster is in the process of developing our policies and developing our thoughts on this, but I expect we're just going to have to move into a world where AI becomes a more accepted, um, aid for, for putting together and some thoughts. You know, it, it wasn't too long ago that a lot of faculty and business schools across the country were opposed to letting their students use calculators during exams, right? Um, you know, fundamentally, this is probably similar to that. Um, but I would say that the way that candidates use it should be very thoughtful. Um, I don't think that candidates should ever be in a spot where they're using it to generate the thoughts, right? Um, and, and I think that's where candidates really stand to lose out on some of their own unique value. If a computer which is amalgamating the entire world's knowledge, um, if, if that is what's putting together your essays or trying to explain why you'd be a competitive candidate, it's probably not capturing the value that you bring because of your own lived experiences. And so I think that there's probably gonna be a place for AI in helping folks 
to synthesize their own story and synthesize their own thoughts. Maybe there's going to be a place for it with some editing or with some, um, you know, some, some spell checking and grammar checking. And again, fundamentally, I, I don't know that that's terribly different than the services that some of the most privileged candidates have always been able to pay for. Um, so in some ways, maybe it's democratizing a little bit of that privilege. I just think it's important that candidates are using it responsibly and still making sure that they tell their own stories because that's, that's the danger. Um, I think as a candidate, if you're looking at this and you have the opportunity to have a computer or a program write your story for you, um, the, the danger is that you're not going to be able to shine through if that same program is writing the essays for everyone else. Um, so it's, it's a tool to maybe help to enhance, but not to generate. And I'd say that's how I would want to approach it. Oh, thank you for that. And I think the, the analog around calculators certainly hits home for an old fogey like me, because I remember when that was um, a big deal. Mm -hmm. um, all right. So let's transition a little bit to the actual application itself and the application process. Um, when you think about recommendations and how a candidate should go about choosing recommend recommenders, we hear a lot from admissions officers about the value of recommendations because they're kind of the the one last thing that can't be um, influenced um, in a significant way by um, you know candidates using admissions coaches or taking doing test prep or whatever. It is truly raw feedback um, unless you're writing it yourself, um, which which we certainly don't encourage. But um, What's, what advice do you have for candidates who are choosing recommenders? Things that you've seen over the years, maybe that people are stretching into recommenders, not using the most appropriate ones. What general uh, feedback do you have around recommendation selection? Yeah, I can answer this one. So what we recommend that students do is to avoid academic references. And that's not going to matter a whole lot for our admissions process. What we do encourage our applicants to do is to gather recommendations from people who can talk about their contributions, their impact in the organization in a meaningful way. Uh, it doesn't have to be an immediate supervisor, although that's an option. This could be someone that has worked with you as a client or a previous supervisor in the professional setting, in the professional work setting. Uh, so that's what a recommendation would be for applicants looking to apply to Foster doesn't necessarily have to be that immediate current supervisor, but just someone who can attest to the quality of work, your contributions with the organization, the impact that you have created. And if they can quantify that, even better to really show, uh, you know, your strengths in that letter of recommendation. Uh, that's very insightful for the admissions committee to, to know and give us a better sense of of what that student might be able to also contribute at the foster school based on, you know, previous um, excellence or performance or contributions, collaborations, uh, impact in any kind of way, shape or form. So that's what I would recommend that the candidate looks for in a recommender, someone who can speak highly of them. It doesn't necessarily have to be that CEO of the company or someone with the title uh, or who can, you know, um, speak well on their behalf if they're just coming in with the title, but someone who really knows them and who can tell us who this person is coming into the program, because that's what we are evaluating. Going back to that foster fit, what are we looking for? Someone who can contribute and be inclusive in the program, because everything that students do here is collaborative in nature. Uh, very community focused and in groups and teams. So we want to also see that be reflected in whoever is writing that recommendation for the student, not just the title of the recommender. And, um, you know, sometimes I just thought of this. Sometimes we get questions around, you know, I, I hate to stereotype, but let's say you have an engineer who has a recommender in engineering and they're very matter of fact, they fill out, like if there's a grid for the recommendation, they fill that out. And then they say, yes, he, this person has my strongest, you know, support. How do you, as a, as a candidate, help the recommender understand that that's helpful, but there's, there's, like, there's a standard that you all are looking for, for going into detail around the candidate, really helping 
them help you? Like, do you have any recommendations for people who are trying to get their recommenders to maybe um, do something beyond what is a typical standard in their industry um, to be able to provide a recommendation that is in line with the others that you're receiving? Yeah. Uh, do you want to no, take no. it? Sure. <laughs> yeah. I, I would say anything that is outside of the box of their typical work experience would be great. So um, any other involvement in the community, any preparation to towards an MBA program, whether it's a uh, certification or a class that the, the prospective student has taken, um, just thinking outside of the box. If an engineer prospective student is getting a recommendation from an engineer supervisor, what's going to be different about that recommendation that could also continue to add value into that student's uh, profile and application holistically? And so it's just going back to that first question about what has their impact been, whether it's within the organization or beyond, that could also be transferable into the MBA experience as well that can add value while the applicant is a student at Foster. If I can chime in on top of that, um, I I think that it's actually a best practice, and this is probably true for letters of recommendation even outside the MBA um, context. If you're asking for a recommendation, I think it's very appropriate to ask to meet that recommender, take them to coffee, sit down with them and actually explain why you're interested in an MBA. Explain to them the relationship that you have and why you want them to talk about it. If there are particular stories you want them to highlight, feel free to share that. You know, obviously we, we can't cross the line and write the letter for them, but I don't think it's inappropriate at all, inappropriate at all to try to coach your recommender and say, hey, here's here's the value that I'm hoping this recommendation can provide to the admissions committee. Um, are you comfortable writing that on my behalf? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's okay to be pretty direct about that. Okay, no, that's really helpful. Um, what about like for the interview process, right? So you've gotten to the recommendation process, you submitted the application. Um, the next big step usually is some sort of interview. So like what kinds of things can candidates do to stand out? Maybe what are some of the things that you've seen that you've really just enjoyed um, seeing in a candidate and, and maybe have you know, taken you over the limit to accept? Yeah, and I'll speak for myself, but feel free to add what, what you would recommend in this instance. But what I really value is when I'm interviewing a student who is coming in genuinely and authentically themselves, that can also present how they might be in the program. Because we are very community focused, team driven, I like to see that the student is very open, genuinely excited to work with a diverse group of students, while also, you know, considering other aspects of the program that are going to be of value to them and vice versa. So as cliche as that may sound, be yourself and really bring your authentic, genuine self to the interview. As much as we want to know about you, this is also an opportunity for you to get to know more about us as a school, as a team, as the MBA programs office, so that this could be a perfect match for the school that you choose. And, you know, we hope that Foster is a school that, that does call your attention because of what we have to offer. Of course, everything else that comes with an interview, um, be prepared, uh, clear communication style. That's something that, that helps us also evaluate candidates in, in a way that allows us to see how they might interact with other classmates um, and be inclusive and open to that. There, I want to emphasize again, the, the strong word of community because that's really what students are coming into. So what does stand out for me is if I can visualize the student being part of the community. There are times that I have interviewed prospective students that it seems that I'm speaking to a current student because they have done the work, because they know what FOSTER stands for, because they see themselves in the program. And that's really what stands out to me, uh, that they've done the work, but that they are also bringing in their, their authentic and genuine self to the program because they are excited, um, excited for it and not just really looking for an admissions offer letter. That's great. And I, I think it very much aligns with kind of what you have been saying 
um, during this podcast about community and, and kind of envisioning yourself on campus and making sure that your interview reflects that. That's fabulous. Um, <clears throat> standardized tests, a lot of noise around it. Um, I'm going to kind of take this question um, in, a, in a direction that, that may be a little unique, but um, how do you kind of think about the test in the context of the overall application process? Um, we know that people put a lot of emphasis on it, sometimes maybe too much. But in addition to that, um, is Foster open to having a frank conversation if someone struggles with the test? Because um, some may feel like they don't want to touch that and they just keep working towards some score that they see on some board somewhere. Um, so value of the test and how you all think about it and also like how open is Foster to actually having a conversation if someone may be struggling with the test a little bit? Yeah, I, I can jump in on this one. And, and I'll start by saying, actually, I, I'll answer that second question first, which is that we've built it into our system that we want to be open to that conversation. Um, we're one of the first top uh, 25 MBA programs that officially went test optional, and we're continuing that policy, meaning that candidates can choose without getting prior approval from us, they can choose how they believe they're going to put their best foot forward, whether that's with or without a test score. Um, so it's not uncommon for folks to talk to us and say, hey, you know, I, I struggle with test scores. And you can look at my grades. You can look at my work performance. Those things are solid. And I say, well, you're right. Your test score is probably not the best representation of your ability. You should apply test optional. So the, the answer to your second question is yes, we're definitely open to that conversation. I think the mechanism to have that conversation so to speak, is going to be by applying using our test optional option. Um, the, the first part of your question, though, is probably more nuanced, which is for, for candidates who do choose to submit a test score, how do we look at it? What does it mean? Um, and here's where it, it actually gets a little complicated because I am afraid that I'm going to, it's going to sound like I'm walking back on what I said before about, you know, the importance of the test. You know, truthfully, it's it is designed, again, notice my language, I'm saying it is designed to be a an impartial and objective metric that signals academic readiness. I appreciate the really hard work. I mean, the hours and hours, years and years of work that goes into creating that. But I still think that that idea, the objective, truly um, impartial and truly predictive metric, I think that's always going to be a goal. And it's something that our partners at the testing organizations are still working toward. Um, and, and right now the, the tests that we have are the best product. It's the closest that we're, that we have to it, but, um, you know, it, it's always going to be a goal. It's, it's not a completed, um, unicorn product by any means. Um, but we are going to try to use it for some of the value that it has. Um, we, we've done our own regressions. We've, we've seen that there is some predictive power with these tests especially the quantitative section, whether it's the quantitative section of the GRE, the quantitative subsections of the GMAT, um, those sections tend to have a fair amount of predictive per, a predictive power for a student's performance later on in an MBA program. So we do look at that. We're going to pay attention to that. Um, and jumping back around, but going back to test optional, if you're going to apply without a test score, given the predictive power of the quant section, I'd say, I hope that I see some strong quant in the other parts of your application if you're not going to have that test score. So strong quant in your undergrad with good grades, maybe the consistent use of quantitative skills on your resume even to this day. Um, but yeah, it, for, for those students who choose to submit it, we are looking at it. It does matter to us, um, but it's, it's always going to be one of several things that we consider. That's really helpful and appreciate the um, thoughtfulness into that answer. Um, let's step inside kind of admissions committee because I think a lot of times people just um, really want to know that, that they're getting a fair shot in the admissions process. So can you give us a, a peek inside the admissions committee at Foster? Um, like, how does it work? Who's involved? Um, we know that there's some magic pixie dust in there at some point, but um, if there's not, you can let us know that as well. Like, what what is the process like and specifically would love to know, um, like take us through maybe an applicant that's on the border, maybe like one or two people really feel strongly for, maybe one person doesn't really like it. Like how does that all get resolved? Yeah. Do you want me to jump on Go this for it. Okay. Yeah, um, <clears throat> yeah I, I would start by saying, I try to do my best. And I think we as a team try to do our best 
to sweep away all the pixie dust, whatever we can. Um, I, I would, I believe that a good process is a transparent one that candidates and evaluators both understand pretty completely. So, you know, uh, to whoever is watching this, the millions and millions of folks, um, if my answer now isn't satisfactory, always reach out to us because we're happy to clarify further. We want to make sure this process is transparent. But essentially speaking, um, inside the admissions committee, when we're evaluating applications, there are basically just two questions that we're asking. The first question is going to be, uh, is a student ready to come in and be successful in the classroom? And to answer that question, we're looking at a number of different pieces, like a test score or probably more realistically, um, your, your transcript with your grades and your classes, maybe a resume. But we're going to use those pieces to answer that first question. Are you ready to come in and be successful academically? Foster, like a lot of our peers, we're very privileged that we have more folks in our applicant pool who are academically ready than we have space to admit. And that's when we move on to the second question, which is about your fit where we want to ask like, hey, on top of contributing to the classroom, are you going to contribute to the community? And we're looking at things like your essays, your, your resume, your recommendations, and of course your interview to answer that. But adding all these things together is a pretty complicated process. So there are a lot of stakeholders involved and it's not just folks from the admissions committee um, or it's not just folks from the admissions team. We are bringing in stakeholders from across the entire MBA program administration. Um, so we are going to have folks do a career review, there's a career management, our career counselors, um, career coaches. They're actually going to go in and look at resumes, look at your goals. We're going to have um, uh, more impartial third-party readers who are going to look just at the deep dive into academics to make sure we're not missing anything. And then, of course, we're going to have um, the, the admissions team or at least folks connected to the admissions office doing the interviews and, and trying to piece all this together. Those reviews happen separately, and then they come together and are pieced together for the final review. And whenever there's a dispute on the final review, the entire admissions committee meets to discuss. Um, and, and we'll be in committee for um, hopefully, hopefully not too long, um, but you know, potentially days at a time to discuss the candidates. And, and one of the instructions that I give when we facilitate that meeting every time is that every candidate is here for a reason, um, every candidate is being discussed because they bring merit to the table. And when you're in that committee, it's my goal to make sure that everyone gets their time in the light, um, that we, we use that opportunity to really discuss any questions that we have and look for the reasons that they could be a good fit here at Foster. That's really helpful. And um, just really quickly, how long does it take approximately? So. You know, the round closes, like walk me through the journey. I, this, I feel like this is a Disney movie, like mm -hmm. the journey of an application. Like how does it flow through and, and approximately how long does it take? Yeah, sure. So from start to finish, it, it depends on the round based on volume, but it's probably going to be anywhere from two to three months between the deadline and when we are releasing a decision. Um, for, for us, th there are a few pretty distinct phases. So regardless of when you submit your application, even if it's even if you apply really early, you, you're a month before the deadline, what we'll do is we'll pull all the applications together and one or two days after the deadline, once everything is trickled in, we're going to send out an invitation to everyone to complete a video interview. That video interview is not live. So that's not done with uh, anybody in real time. Instead, my team and I have recorded uh I don't think I can say the exact number, but a lot of different questions and candidates will randomly be assigned two of them and have an opportunity to record a response to both of those randomly assigned questions. That video interview is then combined with all of the other submitted materials like the transcripts, maybe test scores, recommendations, essays, that's combined there. And then every single candidate is going to be um, is going to be given an initial review where we do a deeper dive to figure out is this a candidate who's competitive enough to move on to be invited to the real interview or the, the main interview? For candidates that are invited to the main interview, um, invitations go out again. It, it's going to vary, but probably two to three weeks after our initial deadline. Um, and then you'll have, as a candidate, if you're invited to the interview, you'll then have the opportunity to schedule an interview one-on-one -on -one with uh, myself or other members of the admissions team. Depending on the volume 
of the interviews that we're conducting, that process, you know, we, we may we may set aside anywhere between one to maybe two months to, co- to go through all those interviews. And at the same time that the interviews are happening, that's when the career review happens. That's when the application deep dive happens. And so those those reviews are happening independently, but in a parallel system. Um, and they all come together again at the end of that interview process, which is when we do the final reviews with all the different reviews uh, stacked up next to each other. So basically, it's pretty easy. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and, and as a candidate, I'm sure you understood everything that I just said. <laughs> right. um, well, I think um, we have just dispelled the myth of those who are like, well, I didn't get in because my test score wasn't good enough, or I didn't get in because my GPA wasn't good enough. And I think I think what you're hearing is that's a lazy way to look at it, right? Like, um, I, I think that Foster's saying very clearly, they take this process very seriously. They do a holistic review. And a lot of people look at a lot of different things in order to make this process work. So thank you for sharing that, Brian. Mm-hmm. And I guess if I had to force you, um, and I'm going to take away all of the different factors except for one, maybe two or three, if you had to choose, I, what would you choose just out of curiosity? And obviously the, the caveat here is like, he doesn't have to choose. He gets a chance to see everything holistically. But if you had to hone in on a few factors that are kind of the most important factors in the process or the ones that are most telling, I should, I'm not even going to say most important, but most telling for mm-hmm. you where you see differentiation, where would those be? Oh my goodness. I, I mean, it, it is so complicated, but, and sorry, no, I'm, I'm doing a lot of talking right now, but I, I'll try and pick two. Um, again, the lawyer in me says, just be very clear. It's not just two, but if I had to pick two, I think that the undergraduate GPA tends to be the most predictive individual factor in terms of academic readiness. And then a candidate's resume to us is incredibly important. Understanding what sort of experience they're bringing from their professional life and how they may have the opportunity to leverage that into their future goals, that really matters to us. Um, so if, if I had to just pick two things, those are probably the two. Okay, no, that's really helpful. I think there's a lot of word docs that just opened up to uh, to take a look, one more look at those resumes. So thanks for <laughs> yeah. that. Um, okay, um, we're going to jump into myth versus reality here, where we're going to share something, and you're going to say fact or fiction. I'm going to share a statement with you, and you're going to say yes, that's true fact, or no, that is not true fiction, and you're going to give me a, a really short uh, commentary on it if you'd like to. Um, so let's get started. Y'all ready? Yeah. All right. First question. Um, you have the best chance as an applicant to get in round one. Fact or fiction? Probably fiction. Um, the, the reality here is that we're looking for candidates to apply when they feel like they can put their best foot forward. And if spending the extra two months to a, submit a stronger application in round two, if that makes sense, you probably stand a better chance in round two. Yeah, but number two is you won't get any scholarships unless you apply round one or round two. You won't. There's no scholarship available in like round three at all, right? That one is definitely a fiction, I'm happy to say. You know, we admit students in round one knowing that more students are going to apply in round two. And we do the same thing with scholarship money. We award money based on the fact that we know we're going to bring in more students in round two and round three. So there's definitely scholarship of money, scholarship money available. Uh, and again, for context, we've been able to award scholarships to um, all of our incoming students for the past two years, including those who applied in round three. That's also good news for candidates. Number three, there's nothing you can do to get off the wait list. You just have to wait. That's why they call it the wait list. I'm going to say fiction, actually. Um, you know, there, there are some things that you can do to, to make sure that we are well, that you're well connected with us. Um, explain, further explain your interest in foster. Um, take an opportunity to write to us and explain how you, how you've managed to stay connected with us and the things that maybe you've done in the meantime to learn more about us. Additionally, if there are, if there are things that you perceive as areas for growth in your original application, like let's say you chose to submit a test score and you know that you really could have done better, 
retake the test. Um, you know, basically, even in that waitlist time, we're able to accept new and updated materials. So stay connected with us. Make sure that we know that you're that you remain interested, and if necessary and appropriate, try and make some changes. All right. So number four, you can still get into business school even if you don't have a quant or analytical background. Fact or fiction? Fact. No more explanation needed there. There we go. Um, number five, for Foster and their full-time program, do you need a minimum amount of work experience to be considered for the program? Mm, that's fact-ish. Um, you know, we don't have an official minimum years of work experience, but I would say we, we apply a lot of scrutiny to anyone who's going to be applying who will have fewer than um, two or three years of total work experience, full-time work experience, by the time the program starts. Um, you know, I'd say our most competitive candidates are usually coming in with between four to seven years of experience by the time the program starts. Definitely outside of that is possible, um, but it's it's pretty rare that anyone would be a real competitive candidate with, with fewer than two years. Okay. Um, the GMAT is preferable to the GRE in the application. Fiction. Okay. And um, what tests as of summer 2023 do you all consider as part of the application process if they want to submit a test? Sure. For the full-time MBA program, we'll look at the GRE and the GMAT. And that'll include the new version of the GRE with the no distinction there and the GMAT, the, the current version as of this recording and the GMAT focus edition. We're not, we're not going to have a preference between any of those. For our other MBA programs at Foster, GMAT, GRE, in all their variations, totally fine. But the executive assessment is also acceptable for, for any of our part-time MBAs. Excellent. Um, so, heard of this before. Candidates have to score within 80% of the median test scores to get into your program. Fact or fiction? Fiction. And again, uh, you know, if you're thinking about it, statistically, 20% or I guess 10% of our candidates are coming in below that um, that 10th percentile mark. So, um, you know, a lot of those candidates on the test score side, if you're submitting one and you are lower on the range, I'm hoping that you compensate for that with some strengths in other areas of your application. But mathematically, it's impossible for everyone to come in in the middle 80%. Okay. Brent just dropped some first year statistics on you. It might have gone over your head, but that's okay. You'll be fine once you get to business school. Um, Okay, a low GPA will prevent you from getting into an MBA program. Fact or fiction? Fiction. S similar to the to the GMAT or the test score, um, you know, we, we have a range there. And I would say that if for folks who are coming in on the lower end of the range, it is important that you still bring in those other strengths. You know, this is an opportunity if, you're, if your GPA is below our range or typical range then it's probably worth investing time into, into some test prep so you can compensate for it with that higher ac academic signal. But, you know, we, there's not officially a minimum uh, cutoff point where we're just not going to consider your application. All right. This is a little tricky, uh, maybe nuanced here. You can be too old to apply to a full-time MBA program at Foster. Hmm, good nuance. Um, I'll say that that is a fiction. But I will, I will note that based on the number of years of work experience that you have, you might end up being a much better fit for one of our other MBA programs. And I'm always happy, our team is always happy to talk about that. A lot of it depends on your specific goals and the mechanism by which you'd like to find a career opportunity after the MBA program. The, the opportunities available through the full-time program are pretty much, they're very focused on individuals who are going to be coming in with fewer than 10 years of experience by the time the program begins. But but I would say age itself, less relevant, years of work experience, more relevant. Excellent. Um, we talked a little bit about optional, so I won't ask you that one, but here's one. If you don't get into a top 25 school, it's not worth getting into an MBA, going and getting an MBA at all. I mean, I really think if, if you're not going to foster, it's not worth getting it. I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> No, I, 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 <laughs> um, I would say that's that's definitely a fiction um, The the rankings. Oh, oh my gosh, I'm not going to spend this. You, you wanted a short answer and I'm not going to spend the hours it would take to to share all my thoughts on the rankings. But I will know that they are always just a singular measure 
and they can never truly capture how well a program is going to fit for you as a candidate. Um, and there are a lot of programs that right now are ranked outside the top 25. The next year could be in the top 25. And a lot of programs right now that are within the top 25 that may not be there forever. So remember, those rankings are, they are but one measure that you may consider looking at when you're evaluating your programs, just like you wouldn't want us to look at um, one part of your application exclusively to make our admission decision. I hope that you as a candidate will never look at just that one factor when you're making your enrollment decision. All right. Last question for you, Brent. Um, the MBA ROI is not as strong in a digital economy. Fact or fiction? I think that that's absolutely a fiction. The, the ROI for an MBA is, is always going to be variable, just like a lot of other programs. But the reality is that the skills that you're getting in an MBA are transferable across industries and across job functions. And the digital age still needs to have folks who understand how to manage people. It still needs to have folks who can think strategically and make data driven decisions. And you're getting that in an MBA. So the, the, the day to day may change and the, the jobs and the job descriptions may look a little bit different, but the skills that you're getting, the ability to learn and think on your feet, that's going to serve you well, no matter where you're going. All right, Brent, you're off the hot seat. Get your lemonade, relax. <laughs> no, it's, you no it's your turn. Um, <clears throat> we have rapid fire. So this part of the podcast, um, I'm going to give you a phrase. And then you're going to give me a few words that kind of come to your mind when I give you that phrase. And I want you to go as fast as possible. And I will, I will buzz you if you take too long. So um, I'm not, I'm not afraid to do that <laughs> um, at all. Are you ready? No. Yes. Sounds good. Ready? Yes. It's I'll just a one that. word. <laughs> it's, it's a one word. You, if you give me too many two words, then I will begin <laughs> buzzing you. Um, Sounds good. Here we go. Number one in rapid fire begin the perfect applicant inclusive and collaborative okay that's three we're not getting off to a good start there no <laughs> okay number two the feeling of getting accepted into your dream program exciting all right now you're getting it i like it i like <laughs> it number three the gmat <sighs> scary all right Number four, admissions myths. Above 750. I like that. I'll accept that one because I like it so much. Um, the top 20. Successful alumni. <laughs> Success alumni. All right. That's fine. And then Washington Foster School of Business. What's the one word? Amazing. Ah, I love it. Um, and, and I actually want Brent's one word for Foster as well. Hmm. Rapid fire. <laughs> it's a hyphenated word. Values okay. driven. Acceptable. Va values driven. Values driven. I love it. And mine, from listening to you all, one word for Foster is going to be community because you all talked about it quite a bit. So I think... Um, First of all, thank you so much um, for your time today. Is there anything else that you'd like to share? Um, we did go through quite a bit today, but is there any anything you want to share before we finish the podcast today? Yeah, I would say reach out to us. Uh, email us at mba at uw.edu for an informational interview just to learn more about the Foster School and get to know us because, as Brent mentioned earlier, what you won't find on the website is the feeling that you will find when you do interact with our community. So do an informational interview with any of our counselors. And I'll just throw another pitch for our diversity event, which is Fostering MBA Access on November 2nd and 3rd, which is a Thursday and a Friday of 2023 in the autumn quarter. This will really be a great opportunity to experience what Foster is like live and get to engage with our alumni students um, and some of our corporate partners as well. So I would say, you know, take a chance, come check us out and uh, reach out. All right, great. Well, thank you very much, Brent Noe, for taking time with us today. We certainly learned a lot um, about Foster and I know our listeners did as well. Until next time, thank you so much for 
listening to our Grad Talk MBA podcast. You can find us at Grad Talk on on uh, Talk on TikTok. That's easy for for me to say. And learn more about us and our admissions, uh, MBA admissions, and, and GMAT GRE products at magoosh.com. Um, so with that, we will end this session. Thank you all so much for being here, and we look forward to seeing you on the next podcast.